Hello everyone, I'm Bill Harris and this is Life Questions, a program that focuses on you and your questions about life. Thank you for sending us your viewer questions that uh, span a number of topics. We've assembled a panel of local ministers to review and research the answers from a biblical perspective. And they are here with us now to show us their results. And I am more than anxious to hear what they have to say. We have, first of all, Pastor Greg Fox of New Hope United Methodist Church in Rawson and the Bluffton Trinity United Methodist Church, followed by Pastor Randy Davis of the Bridge Church in Lima. Then we have Pastor Ben Neff of Mount Tabor Church of God in Salina. Followed, following that, we have Pastor Patrick Kamler, no, one, no stranger to us, of course, of Westminster Christian Church uh, here in this area. Gentlemen, we thank you for being with us. And uh, as I said, I'm, I'm anxious to hear what uh, answers you have to give to some of these questions. One of the one of the big things that's on the Christian front these days is the revival down at Ashbury College in Kentucky. What do you have to say about how that's going on? It seems that, that it has just awestruck a number of people, uh, not only in that local area, but it's, it seems to be uh, having repercussions all over the place in a positive way. Yeah, I think so. You know, I, I, when we experience movements of God and from different people that I've talked to, I think that what happened at Asbury was a movement of God. I think there are, there's the tendency to, we want to make sure that this is, that this is scriptural, that this is something that is of God. It's not a deception of any kind. And, and, and I, I agree with that. All that stuff is fine. But I think there is a certain element of when God is moving and does move, it's going to be very difficult for us to put a, to really get a firm grip on what's going on. Cause there's a lot of things where, you know, God moves as he wants to. And we, what we want to do is, is stay away from the attitude of being pharisaical about things that are happening. Because mm -hmm. even when Jesus was in the midst of Israel, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the scribes were like, Hey, look, this guy is not of God. And I will show you in the scriptures at that time where he is not of God. So I think we want to stay away from that tendency. At the same time, we want to realize that, it doesn't have to be at a at a college campus. Stuff, good things happening on a college campus are good, but it doesn't have to be there. We can have revival in our midst. We can have revival here in Lima. We can have revival no matter where we are. And I think that is maybe the the big takeaway, at least for me, I think, is you don't have to go to Asbury to have revival. You can have it sure. wherever you want to have it. Except that it just doesn't seem that people are having it. <laughs> Revivals That's have right. gone by the wayside, and, and right. here we are in these last days, and, and any one of you ministers around this table can give me at least one thing that's going on in the world that points to the nearness of his return, and nobody's doing revival. Right. Why is people it don't People don't realize that revival does not mean a big tent, a big gathering. The revival is when God comes and touches your heart. The Holy Spirit comes in, yeah. and you can't control the Holy Spirit. And that's why I believe the same as uh, Patrick does it. That was a true movement down in Asbury because it wasn't, wasn't orchestrated. It wasn't put on by a group. It wasn't, it was spontaneous. The Holy Spirit come in and you could not just say, okay, it's over. Stop. The Holy <laughs> Spirit was on a roll and then yeah. it just happened and it spread across the country. It spread across the world. Mm -hmm. And I believe we need to do, the reason we don't see that revive as often anymore is we don't have, we don't take the time to look for God and, and look for the Holy Spirit. We want what we want today, we want to feel good about it, we want to move on. But we need to take time and listen for God and see what He wants. Let Him work in our lives. Excellent. Somebody else wants to chime in? I think one of the things for me is, you know, you're hearing it was simplistic. You know, they were singing some new choruses, they were singing old hymns, they were a different band every hour or whatever, you know, because they were there solid you know for several days yes. didn't go back to their rooms hardly or go to the restroom you know <laughs> didn't go eat and so they've combined fasting maybe not by choice but they didn't want to leave the room yeah. there was a presence and you know it, it's like everybody has different opinions in the church about what creates the presence what 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 do you have to do to get God to show up and and you know some have made it about symbolism some have made it about uh, the design of a room and I think that's what they're now arguing about. Some of the people, again, not necessarily against the revival, but well, here's why your church ain't going to have it because you're not simplistic. You're too complex or you're, 
you know, and it's like, would you stop? Yes. God stop. can move please, in, please. In, a, in a movie theater if he wants to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, Christian movies out right now. Yeah. It's happening. So um, I think God's trying to get the world's attention. Yeah. And if he can do it at Asbury and he can do it in our house or he can do it in a movie theater and God, please do it in the church house. You know, but so many churches, we're in too big a hurry. You know, I know when you got two services or you got two congregations and you got to get it done so you can get everybody out of there to get the next group in. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and we don't even allow time. They basically shut down the classes. Yeah. Maybe. Now, if I'm a college student, I'm all in. You know, <laughs> I, I'll pray all day, man, if I don't have to take that algebra test, you know. So I think that's part of what happens. It's just like, wait a minute. Let's just stop. You know, because we go through the motions. Yeah. You know, going to class. And I remember being in Bible college, man, it's just rigorous. And yet we had to be at chapel. It wasn't yeah. optional. Yeah. <laughs> you missed 10 times, you flunked the semester. You know, I mean, it was pretty rigid. Mm -hmm. and it was like, but there were days Charles Greenaway would come and preach. And you're like, we ain't having class today. Because that man would take over and he would not let you leave till yeah. God touched your soul. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he didn't care about your class because he didn't, it, it didn't matter. Pastor Ben, I want to hear your voice. Yeah, what, what makes plants grow. It's, it's springtime. Things are going to start growing. What makes plants grow? Fertile, fertile soil, right? Mm. And so if you had these people coming, well, let's go back to Peter and when he preached that sermon and they're, and they're cut at the heart. What must I do to be saved? He said, repent and be baptized. We forget the fact that most everyone listening to him knew the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. So their hearts had been prepared mm -hmm. to receive it by hearing biblical truth. So at Asbury, if somebody just comes in and says God's presence here and they, get, they could get caught up in the moment and they could make a commitment to Christ that they don't really necessarily understand. But, but we can't just pinpoint that and go, okay, that's, that, everyone is like that here. There are people that, you know, God's been pouring into and this, the word has been poured into and finally it seems like something connected for them. And then they spent dedicated time, what, reading God's word, praying and worshiping him, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the beauty is that that revival can happen, we said anywhere, because when J Jesus died on the cross, that holy of holies, that the curtain was torn and that presence went out so that we can experience that anywhere, but we have to spend that dedicated time there. And ultimately there has to be an element of repentance, that a confessing yes. of our sin to say, all right, you know, you need to deal with this in my life. That's, that's what revival is, is bringing life and putting life into it. Mm -hmm. And so coming out of the darkness and stepping in light and saying, all right, here it is, Lord, and wash me new. You know? yeah. Go ahead, you know what revival does too, is it exposes our, our sacred cows. Oh, yeah. It exposes oh, yeah. our idols and, and, and the biggest idols that, that we have that I saw coming out of this were time management. <laughs> I'm not banging on time management, but I'm just saying time management was one of them. And the other one was pure theology because we have to have any movement of God has to completely line up with my theology, my systematic theology, my reformed theology, mm -hmm. my whatever it is. And if it deviates from that at all, then it can't be a movement of God because Martin Luther said this can't happen or, or whoever, pick your, pick yeah. your person, doesn't matter. I'm not banging on Lutherans. But the thing is that we hold those things up higher than we hold up a movement of God and we hold those yeah. things up yeah. higher than we hold up the Holy Spirit. When Pentecost happened, Jesus did not say, all right, so here's how we're gonna build the church. Here's my 10 step plan on how we're gonna do this. <laughs> the Spirit came on them, go. Yep. There was a crowd around them. They were able to hear them in the different tongues that they were speaking in the different languages. That's how the church started. Mm -hmm. And they decide, okay, well, uh, we need to do this. Well, uh, there's a lot of hungry people here. We should probably feed them, you know? And there's people here that are sick. And there's people here that need to hear about this movement of God, who, by the way, you people were okay with him being crucified. So you guys need to repent, kind of what you were saying there. There was no 10-step plan. There was no 12-step plan on how mm -hmm. to do this. It was God's spirit shows up. Now you go and do something yeah. about it. And I think if we're ever serious about revival, we have to let go of our theology to an extent. Yeah. And we have to let go of our, of our time management. And you're right. We plan services. We do all this kind of stuff. We don't really allow that time for the spirit because, you know, Applebee's closes at a certain point in time. And we don't want to get involved with that. But that also means that you should be seeking God on other days of the week besides Sunday. Yeah, Absolutely. very good. Well, okay, and, and, you know, central to all of this, of course, is the Bible. One of, another one of the questions we got in is, uh, what should the role of the Bible be in a Christian's life? And, and, and particularly for those new Christians who came out of this revival, and for those of us who have been <coughs> around for a little while and know the Bible. And, and Pastor Randy, I know this is a part yeah. of your heart. Uh, you know, speak and, to that. And I grew up in church my whole life, 
you know, I always tell people I had a drug problem growing up. I was drugged Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, every revival. And, you know, it was pounding to me, Psalms 119.11, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. People don't hide God's word in their heart anymore. They don't even read the Bible. And so many people don't even carry a Bible except on their phone, which I do because mm -hmm. I can mm -hmm. read it. I can blow the words up real big. But, but the point is, if you don't start somewhere to read the word, then hunger grows. Then you study the word to show yourself approved is another one. Um, but, but you need to know God's word so you can defend your faith. What's happening right now, every funeral I do of people that I don't know, and I get a lot of calls for those because I'm willing to do them. Mm -hmm. Because to me, it's the most fertile soil you ever preach to. I'm telling you. And, uh, but I can't tell you, Bill, how hungry people are to prove that dad went to heaven. Now, they yeah. have no biblical basis. Yeah, yeah. But the alternative is hell. And they can't imagine their great dad that was so good to these four boys. I mean, it was so vivid at this one service. Yeah. They spent one hour before the service convincing me because a track fell off in the floor, off a newspaper in, the, in, the, in a shelf in the garage when they were cleaning up some of the stuff, that this track was there. They knew dad had found Jesus. Wow. Okay, I hope he did. Again, I'm not, I'm not trying to refute what they were saying, right. but what, what hit me was their desperation. Mm -hmm. But they don't know it by the word. I need to repent. I need to be born again. I need, I need to know what God says. Mm -hmm. And I think too many church people don't even know what they believe. And so every time Uncle Joe dies, it's assumed he went to heaven. Yeah. Now, Uncle Joe may have never went to church, may have been a rounder and done all kinds of crazy things, but nobody can think that Uncle Joe went to, to hell. Yeah. which is the only two choices according yeah. to the church. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that's why, you know, the world needs a better biblical worldview. The church needs to know what they, they believe. And we have to lead in that effort, don't we? We're the ones Absolutely. Who, who supposedly know the word of God. We need to Give use it. the Bible as our roadmap for our life. Absolutely. And I had a very good friend of mine who passed here a couple months ago. And I did not know, and I feel like I, I failed him, I did not know where he was going when he died. That's my mission now. I want to know where you're going and you're going and you're going when you die. That's, that's my job. Mm -hmm. That's my, my calling on my heart. I want to know you know where you're going. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have to guess when you're gone. I think we need to do that more as pastors. We need to do that more as Christians. We just assume right. it's going to happen. You can't assume that. Right. You have to sit down and make sure they understand it and share that roadmap of life with people so they know where they're going. You know, you, you, you touched on a, a very key point at, at a funeral, you, very fertile soil, you called it, because yes, people will come to church who ordinarily would not. And it's a great time to expose them to the word of God. And, and that has to be done, of course, gingerly and, and, and very uh, right. with, with a lot of wisdom because people are there. They're mourning the loss of their loved one as well. Uh, what do you have to say about different opportunities to share the word of God in non-traditional settings? so that people can know and hear the word. Any thoughts? Or, I see your minds are just racing. <laughs> well, I, I think the, the opportunities, you kind of have, you have to meet people where they are. You know, you can't <laughs> roll out all the scrolls of people who have no familiarity with the Bible whatsoever. But I think there's, there's opportunities to, there, there's an opportunity in the fact that we are so biblically illiterate as a society, even as, even as Christians. Like mm -hmm. there's, there's a huge opportunity there because there's a lot of people who don't know Scripture or really don't know what the Bible is. We, we categorize it with different things, but what the Bible really is is the inspired Word of God as God reaching out to His stubborn, stiff-necked people <laughs> and His story of redemption and mm -hmm. how He desperately loves us and wants us to be in relationship with Him. And all of Scripture testifies to that. There are people who are rotten liars, just like you and me. There are people who are adulterers, just like you and me. And God loves them, and God works to redeem them and restore them, and that reaches its fulfillment in the person and ministry of Jesus Christ. You start with that, that that's what Scripture is, and then you can go on to, okay, well, how do I know that He has redeemed me? Well, here's how you do it. You go, you go through Romans or wherever, like, if you believe Jesus is Lord, if you confess with your mouth that He is Lord and that you confess of your sins, you will be saved. And you can do that in any place. And if nothing else, if revival has taught us nothing else, if all this stuff has taught us nothing else, you don't need a church to do that. You can do that in a bar. You can do that in a field. You can do that in Walmart. 
You can do that wherever. All right, let's pause for a moment. We're a little bit on overtime here for, for a break. And when we come back, I'd like to pick up along the same theme again. And, and how do we study the Bible to the point where, we're beyond, where we are beyond just reading it? We're studying it. We'll pick up where we left off right after this, right after this message. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, and we're back. And another viewer has written in a question, how do you study the Bible beyond the point of just reading it? Fellow ministers, what sayest thou? How do you study the Bible without just merely reading it? What techniques should we have and the like? Especially with new Christians, um, new to Christ. The best thing to do, if you just take this Bible and say, here, go read it, you'll be better. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I have a hard time just sitting down reading it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Until you really get into it. The best thing to do is, is to have, we talked earlier about mentors or someone that can, can walk alongside with you. Um, we have a thing through Revive Ohio where if someone gives their life to Christ, we, as, we assign them, quote, a mentor, spends a year with them. We walk through the Bible uh, with a, a Project 52 book that we use. But you know, the best part is to share with somebody else to be able to understand what it is. And, you know, obviously I've been around church my whole life just like you were. And every time you have Bible study or every time you share the Bible with somebody and, and discuss a scripture or a passage, I find something new every time. And it's that way when you're working with new Christians. Um, we always are able to learn. And, you know, I made a comment earlier, it's, it's the map of our life. It should be our roadmap for life. And we need to, when you first look at a roadmap, you get lost. So you look at the legend or find somebody that can show you how to follow that. Same thing with the Bible. And that goes back to understanding what Scripture is, too, and, have, and having that person who will walk alongside you and help you doing that. When I was, well, even before I was a Christian, I was looking up Scripture, and I had a friend who at that time was going into the ministry, ended up going into ministry, that I could say, hey, hey I, the pastor at church said something today really weird. I know we're all familiar with that comment. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out what he means by that. So we'd walk through it, and he'd kind of give me an answer, and either, you know, sometimes it was, well, here's what that meant, or yeah, that pastor really is kind of weird. Here's what that, what that should have said. But I had that person to, to walk through it and help me understand what it is. And you know, again, that, that element is missing and it's very important. It's like, you know, how, how do I read a psalm? What do I take from the Proverbs? When I'm looking at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what is, what is my understanding of that? What should I take away from that? It's very, very difficult for anyone to get into it and just, as you said, just hand someone a Bible and start reading. Much more difficult if you have the King James Version. Right. You need to remember from what you said earlier, we need to go to where those people are at. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Someone who just come out of Bible college that knows verse of scripture off the top of their head are going to scare a lot of new Christians who have just come out of the world of sin. They're just giving their life to Christ. We need to meet them where they're at. You know, like you said, we can't give them a King James Bible right off the bat. We're going to run them off. You may have to start with a common English Bible or NIV or something more along the language that they're used to. We were just talking earlier how our, our Bibles on our phones have 71 different versions. If you can't find one in there that fits you, we need to look a little harder. <laughs> yeah, we take someone who's brand new to it and start talking about the soteriology of the Apostle Paul. And I'm like, what, what? what? Yeah, yeah, yeah Mr. Ben, what about, um, here's another question. What are some key ways to share faith with others? Some of the key ways to share faith with others. Share faith, well, in the context of God's word, you think? Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, so often, if it's on our tongue, we've hidden our hearts, it should be when somebody says, oh my gosh, this world is just going to hell, you know, and you can say, well, you know, Matthew 24 says that these things are coming. Mm -hmm. And and we know that. And you know what, that last book that's really confusing, I can sum it up in two words, Jesus wins. 
and you know he studied. <laughs> you know, we know he's coming back, and and so he he is. We have an opportunity to be saved, you know, as his chosen people, uh, and and giving those people the opportunity to hear that. I think that so often we have those conversations with Christians, but when we're around non-Christians, we might hesitate to say, "Hey, Jesus wins," because they might say, "Well, what?" Uh, what about, you know, that, but to the, you know, I don't, I don't agree with that. Or I'm not sure. But to your funeral point that they're asking those questions. And so I think just having it on our tongue and, and having those verses and encouragements to them, because it is encouraging me to say that, you know, to them. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, yeah. we got to remember too, the fact that we need to, to bring our Bible with us in our heart and everything we do. Um, I do a lot of professional motorsports announcing, and I was going to give it up completely because I, I need to spend more time with the church. And my dad brought up a very good point. He says, you have, you know, do the nationals in Bowling Green, you have 60,000 people listening to your word and listening to what you're saying. Now, you can't sit up there and preach the Bible to them, but you can go by your actions and how you relate to things and how you respond to things. Now, you don't have to do it in the secular way. You can do it as a Christian and touch those people the same way. Mm -hmm. For me, it's, you know, I, I tell people all the time, people learn more about Jesus by how we live and conduct our business. And I think that's two things. How you live is what you do in your everyday life. Mm -hmm. But how you do business is how you treat people when you buy a car from a dealership in town or uh, how you treat the waitress. Yes. You know, and it was, you know, the, the sad part for years, a lot of waitresses and waiters did not want to work on Sundays because Christians were picky and rude and cheap. <laughs> Three things. And my sister was a waitress for a long time. And she said Sunday, she worked at a Western Sizzling. She goes, I would make a tenth of what I would on a Friday night from the people drinking and whatever. They were more generous than the church people. And we wonder why nobody wants to be like us. So, so folks, the greatest witness we have to reach people wherever they're at is by living it before them and treat people with kindness. And I, I've said so many times, some of the meanest people I know go to church every Sunday. <laughs> now, they're not at my church. They're at Pat's church. But, you know. <laughs> Sunday, but, 1030. But <laughs> seriously, seriously, I mean, it's like, what part of be you kind to one another do we not understand? It's that yeah, simple. Yeah. Bill, you're a genuinely kind person you can't help because jesus is in you your kindness shows every time the first time i met you i'm like i like this guy he's got <laughs> wisdom in there he just by how you speak okay. there's an anointing there's there's something fresh i heard ben today i'd never met ben before today yeah. we're talking earlier i'm like there's something in that guy yeah, yeah. it's real not and i already know these guys so i know it but it, but isn't that what it should be isn't that what yeah. a christian yeah. is and patrick you're talking about meeting where i'm known as a football pastor I use sports to tell mm -hmm. kids about Jesus. Mm -hmm. One guy told me one time who was a really good Christian football player, one of my closest, dearest friends, he said, you know these guys are just coming to throw up their tokens to the football gods. I go, I don't care why they're here, but while they're here, yeah. I'm going to tell them about Jesus. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. if they're coming to get a better yards per carry average, I don't care. Maybe they will, yeah. but I'm, I know they're going to get Jesus, and that's that's on me. So right, and that's a good point too. You know, and it's important for us to realize that not every conversation needs to end with an altar call. You know, we're not going to get a conversion every single time. We want to, we want to, we want to plant. We want to harvest. That's right. In, in the and same to time, to, and to know when to harvest. Yeah, you yeah, know? exactly. So. <laughs> That, you know, so we, we kind of, we almost put too much pressure on ourselves when we do that. It's like, well, I need to, if I, if I don't convert these people, right sure now, I have failed as a Christian. It's like, well, no, they've, you've given them the truth. Mm -hmm. And maybe that goes along with the truth they've heard from someplace else. And, yeah. you know, God continues to work on that and yeah. he continues to, to work in that field. You know, I've, I've preached sermons that have been outside of a church and they weren't sermons and they were, ser they were sermons of like a sentence mm -hmm. or a couple sentences. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've, when people will right before they're going in to testify in a trial or out on the street or yeah. I talked to someone, one of the one of the people who used to go to my church and so she's not mean anymore, but uh, they had never heard the gospel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, you sat in church for 50 years. You never heard the gospel. Wow. 
So that was probably the hardest one for me. Yeah. You know, th- like, like for instance, um, you, were say, you, you were saying, Pastor Randy, you were saying that y- you are the uh, football preacher. And, mm-hmm. and, 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 and this gentleman here, um, you know, this, this is the, uh, what did you say? Motorsports. Motorsports, and also call, referred to as the hillbilly pastor. So uh, in, in that context, Pastor, how do, you, how do you conduct the Lord's affairs? Not the way most people do. Um, it's amazing how God uses different people in different ways. And I've been fortunate enough that my background is a little sketchy. Um, my past is, as you say, haunts you sometimes. But God has been able to use me places where people, people, what you might think is the ideal pastor, or the, the good pastor, they would never get through to the people that I can get through to because I know where they're at. I've been where they are. And I can work with them and I can, I can love them knowing that, there's good in there. We just got to find it. Mm-hmm. We don't have to find it. They have to find it. We know God's in there. He just wants to come out. He wants to be, wants you to feel him. And when you get that, the feeling is unbelievable. And, and I'm raw. I'm rough. I'm not that perfect pastor. And I told both my churches when I got there, that you deserve somebody better than me. But you know what? And because of an injury, I got my bibs on today, but that's who I am. And when you go to the people, I don't care whether you're a, a, a Bible college graduate or a school of hard knocks, if you give them what's in your heart that God gives you, it's going to make a difference. And you talk about planting the seed and harvesting and cultivating. I really believe God has put me on this earth to, to plant the seed and cultivate. I don't get very many harvests. There's people that can do that. Mm-hmm. I got a friend of mine, every time I get a seed planted, he rolls in and gets the harvest. I'm like, time out here. <laughs> but you know what? We all have a purpose, and God yeah. uses us in our own way. And, and, and you don't feel intimidated if you know you're in that purpose and you're getting results in Absolutely. that purpose. Yeah. You know, I think the biggest lesson in all of witnessing, you're not working for today. You're working for someday. And I remember a, a youth pastor told me that back when I was a youth pastor. He was older and been around a long time. He said, Randy, remember with these young people, they're going to be up and down, in and out every day. Ben, I'm sure you can relate. And he goes, you're not working for today, you're working for someday. And I've been out long enough that I have the kids still from way back in the day or a football player from 20 years ago. You remember that time you did that talk on the bandana? Yep, yep, I remember. And they're like, I still got that. And I'm thinking, the seed was planted, what God does with it. I'm not responsible. I just got to plant seeds. And so for all you people that get discouraged sharing your faith, we're working for someday. And it may be after we're gone that they finally come to Christ. But just do what you can while you got time and knowing that they made it to heaven. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a great, great witness. Meanwhile, we've got to wrap up for today and encourage you to be back with us again next week at the same time on this same Christian station. Until then, for these great pastors, I'm Bill Harris, and we want to thank you for being with us today. Bye-bye for now. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.